Hi, I'm Dr. Jared Gardner, and I'm here today with my awesome dermatology residents, pathology residents, and dermpath fellows. And we are going to talk about metabolic and deposition diseases, which is kind of a group of different, not totally related entities, but stuff that deposits in the skin that's not supposed to be there. So let's start with case one. Who'd like to take this one? I can do this one. Okay. Um, so just looking at the low power, we see there's this big uh, empty spaces in the dermis and almost gives the collagen like a cracked appearance with maybe some eosinophilic deposition in there. Um, my first thought on this was like, you know, the cracked spaces almost made me think of like colloid milium or amyloid, um, one of those. Um, but I can also see that the uh, the deposition is around eccrine glands mostly or the eccrine glands are ah. trapped there. So that makes me think more of lipoid proteinosis, but I think clinical information would be very helpful in this case. Good. So what what kind of clinical presentation does lipoid proteinosis have? Yeah, it looks almost like amyloid deposition, but it's usually around the eyes. Um, that's one of the common locations. Mm -hmm. And I think there's like uh, larynx and phary pharyngeal involvement also. But I was just... Uh, for those online viewers, I was uh, telling my residents right before we started that I had to look this up because this is one of those diseases, and there will be several of them in this episode, um, that I can never keep straight in my head because, number one, to my knowledge, I've never seen a real-life case of lipoid proteinosis. It's rare. It's uh, autosomal recessive to my recollection. And what is the protein that deposits? Does any, do any of you guys remember? There's like a gene that's known because it's autosomal recessive, but I can't remember the protein. It's like... Uh, yeah, it's the extracellular matrix protein 1. Okay, ECM1. ECM one. And so it's interesting because it to me, like you, like you mentioned, it looks a lot like amyloid. It's pink, it's homogenous or hyalinized. Hyalos is the Greek word for glass. And so glassy, we use that word a lot in pathology, hyalinized or glassy. It means like kind of smudgy and even looking and has the pink and has cracks between it, right? So if you show me this, my first thought is going to be amyloidosis, okay? And I think in real life, that is exactly what I'd do. If I had a case like this, I would try, you know, uh, I like thioflavin T as a stain for amyloid. I think it in, in my laboratory works better than Congo Red. Um, this material lipo in lipoproteinosis does stain weekly, at least, with Congo Red and thioflavin T. But I would say that's kind of the problem is that, you know, amyloid doesn't always have, you know, the books teach you apple green biofringence on Congo. In real life, unless you have a real bright microscope and a, a really uh, high performing Congo red stain in your lab, I think it's a, lo a lot more challenging to get Congo red to work that way in real life. So weak versus strong. I mean, that's that's kind of one of those things that's nice to memorize for tests. But in real life, it's harder to sort this stuff out, I think. So if I had this in real life, what I would honestly do is, yes, get clinical information, but also I would send this out. Uh, for mass spectrometry. So uh, mass spec is a great way to uh, subtype amyloid. So when I see something that is definitely amyloid, I usually send it for mass spec to determine if it's light chain or AL type amyloid, uh, which has a higher you know, risk of having a systemic involvement, like systemic amyloidosis, uh, or some other type of amyloid, or something that's not amyloid, actually. And it's interesting because I have had cases of amyloidosis, like uh, it was a, to my recollection, what was it? A, it was amyloidosis in like a synovium in a in a an elderly woman who had like a hip replacement, and I happened to notice some little nodules of amyloid underneath the synovium, which I thought was kind of odd. And I sent it out for mass spec, and you know what it came back as? It came back as extracellular matrix ECM, but it wasn't ECM one; it was a different number, and it it was something I had never heard of before. But it had been associated with amyloid deposits in elderly females, not usually associated with systemic disease. So all these unusual depositions of proteins can give us this similar amyloid-like appearance. So I think that's really, to me, that's interesting because there's like a link then, right? Something that was amyloid and is a type of amyloid that showed up elsewhere in the body, not in the skin, but it was also a different type of extracellular matrix protein. But like you said, the, the way that lipoid proteinosis starts is that you get deposits of this pink material, which I think the name lipoid proteinosis, uh, at least according to the McKee uh, Derm textbook, um, is that there is some some lipid, uh, there was thought to be some lipid component to the de deposition, at least at one point in time. So, um, and that's where I think lipoid got into the name. Because otherwise, lipoid, I would never have looked at this and thought that lipoid would be a 
fitting name for this. So it starts as pink de homogeneous deposits around capillaries and around eccrine coils. Right down here, like you nicely pointed out, we can see that beautifully depositing there. But I'll tell you, uh, amyloidosis, uh, light chain amyloid, can deposit around eccrine coils and around vessels too. So um, I would send this out for mass spec in real life. I would also do Congo and thioflavin first, of course. Um, and then I think you brought up a good uh, differential as well, um, is colloid milium, which is another one of those diseases I can't remember because A, I rarely see it, and B, it looks a lot like amyloidosis. It has homogenous stuff in cracks. It looks, the, my understanding there is that it's a deposit of different proteins uh, that are somewhat related to, to solar elastosis. If uh, memory serves, it's been a little while since I read about it. And it's another one of those things that I've, I think I've maybe seen one or two cases in real life, but the last time I thought, ah, this is going to be a good example of colloid milium. And I sent it out for mass spec and guess what it came back as? Light chain amyloid. It was not colloid milium, it was amyloidosis. So, uh, just so you know, you can read the little clues in the books, but I'll tell you, in real life, thankfully, we have some technology that can be done. I, uh, for anyone watching this online, I send my mass spec to Mayo Clinic. I have no financial conflict of interest. I've been really happy with the, the work they do. Um, I send the, the tissue block there. They give a nice report and tell, uh, they, they look for amyloid, and if they find amyloid or, or another deposit that they think can be dissected out, they'll dissect out that part of the tissue, and they do mass spec, which is this crazy technology for anyone who doesn't know that breaks apart the molecules into tiny little bits and lets them fly through this like chamber and where the particles land tells what the molecular weight is. This is my super um, non-scientific uh, explanation because frankly, the physics of it is mind boggling and I don't know how people ever figured this out. This is what really smart folks do. For me, I'll stick with pathology. All right. That's lipoid proteinosis. If anyone out there is watching this and has a better uh, knowledge for me about how to diagnose this versus amyloid, please leave a comment down below. Thank you very much. Does plasma cell help to differentiate this entity? Does what? I'm sorry? Plasma cell. Plasma cells. That's a great, okay, so that's a great question. So plasma cells in amyloidosis. So this, there are two, when we have light chain amyloid deposits in the skin that make like either perivascular or a nodule of amyloid that's light chain, there are two different main situations that we can have. One is systemic amyloidosis involving the skin, okay? In that situation, someone will usually have a clonal plasma cell process elsewhere in their body, like in their bone marrow or circulating plasma cells, and they may or may not have any plasma cells localized in the skin. The other situation is called nodular amyloidosis. I don't really love this name because nodular amyloidosis, it sounds like it means, oh, you you call it that when there's a nodule, but guess what? Systemic amyloidosis can produce nodular aggregates of amyloid in the skin. So the difference is that nodular amyloidosis, by definition, is light chain, AL type amyloid, deposited in the skin by clonal plasma cells, but the plasma cells are limited to the skin only and they're not present systemically. So it is a diagnosis of exclusion. If someone has uh, plasma cells that are there in the skin and AL type amyloid, then they must have clinical workup, usually a bone marrow biopsy. They may do some other types of imaging to check their heart and other things for involvement. And if they've excluded systemic disease, then you can call it nodular amyloid, which basically is cutaneous limited uh, AL type amyloidosis. And a subset of those patients will then later progress to systemic amyloidosis uh, based on what I've read. So anytime I get AL light chain type amyloid in the skin, it is useful if you see plasma cells around there to think, ah, maybe this is one of those nodular amyloid cases that's limited to the skin, but they still must get clinical workup to exclude systemic involvement. So that's a great question. So you, you don't always have plasma cells uh, present in the skin, but if you do, that is a good clue for, for amyloid and could potentially be the, the skin limited type of nodular AL type amyloid. Great question. All right. Thank you.